good. Might as well just get started. We could have fun with that. We could have started with your now. All right, everybody. So if you're here, this is the pre-show banter. We will start in 35 minutes, which means you can fast forward to the recording here on Go to Webinar for 35 minutes and get to the start of the webcast if you want to. And Ethan now we're and Derek. streaming. And now we're streaming. So uh, that's good. And, so and if I you're watching, for a few seconds. <laughs> if you're watching the webcast, uh, you can go ahead and fast forward about 34 minutes and get to the beginning of the webcast with Ethan and Derek today. Uh, we don't edit the videos anymore on YouTube. That's where we can turn it around immediately. So it's immediately available. Uh, so that way, in case you missed it live, you can go ahead and watch it whenever you want to. Hey, everybody. Hey. Hi. Uh, that was for you all. That was for you all. Oh, hi. Okay. Hey. I know I use my live stream voice, but it, it was for you. Hey, <laughs> hey, ho. We won't go. You know, I was just thinking oh, no. if we're on Hollywood Squares, Ethan is right above me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Lions above you. M's in the middle. Right. Ethan's in Tim the middle. Is in the middle. Yeah. Ethan. Tim's in the middle for me. We why Ryan can, why can't we have these the same? Because it could be so funny when we go. Well, Ralph, what do you think? Because Ralph's right here. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. we can have oh. it consistent. Hello, Keith. <laughs> hi, hi, Ralph. I mean, I why do. is it different for everybody? Shouldn't it just be? No. I, that's what I said. Why is it if random? You, no. I mean, actually, Ethan should be in the middle. This is his thing. Yeah, so. That's what I see. They should have a button so you could just juggle it up, right? Just change them randomly. And then you could have we a need. game to figure out where you're going to be. Yeah, I would like to select do. Tim for the block. <laughs> <laughs> it would be so awesome to play Hollywood Squares on it. Yeah, what they should do is they should always have like a dark, like a, a black one, a blank one, right? And that way, and then move it around so that way you could like play that game where you used to try and order the colors or the numbers like by moving oh, the yeah. 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 Hated that yeah. game. Try I to swear get to God, it would be so fun to play Hollywood Squares at Wild West Hack and Fest this way. Have a yeah. bunch of funny answers and have people. Let's, you could plant some bogus answers and stuff. Let's uh, awesome. send a feature request to go go to webinar. See what they say. Well, but if we did it at Wild mm -hmm. West Hack and Fest, it, we'd throw it up on screen in a room. Oh, okay. And and then we we pull yeah. two two customers out to be like contestants. And then we'd ask a bunch of security questions and have people. So we wouldn't be in the same room as the projection. No, that... all of us would be in, a, in okay. our hotel room or whatever. Well, that sounds a whole lot safer than a building. One of us their, like in structured a room. Well, it'd all be set up room. like the real thing, you know. So we have to like climb up ladders to get to the top. And... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a we'll have a Rick build us Hollywood Square. <laughs> I mean, the space is big enough that we're, you know, while those hack fest usually, I mean, it's like got the big state. I mean, just saying it'd be possible, right? I mean, we built a hall of doors. How hard can it be? That's oh, right. You know. Hey, Maxwell Smart's asking, hey, Ethan, are you working on any more tutorials? Yeah, I'm answering now. Well, actually, to me, Ethan is a tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I talk to him, I learn something new. <laughs> yes, but when you ask him how to make chicken soup, you get a dissertation on quantum physics. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's important with chicken soup. That's yeah. important, yeah. <laughs> it, it really is the you basis the for right, all chicken soup. You, you got to get the right energy levels, and it really helps if you just add a dash of superconductor. <laughs> Look, I find that the muons are just way overdone in most soups. <laughs> but do you have to know the chicken first? or Why did the chicken even get in the pot? That is just a dumbass thing to do. If you look at the chicken while it's cooking, does it cook? No. <laughs> yeah, it cooks slower. It'll cook, it just won't boil. Yeah. It'll just cook slower if you look at it. It's both cooked and uncooked at the same time. Ah, uh, it's, it's no, Frodinger's chicken. If it's enclosed in a box. Which <laughs> I would not, could not in that box. Uh, all right, everybody. Reminder, this is not the webcast. The webcast will begin in 31 minutes. If you're here early. Thanks for being here early. There's 62 of you. And either you got the time zone wrong or you wanted to hang out with us today. And so if it's the time zone, well, look at all this bonus material. Uh, if you wanted to be here, then it's great to see you. So. Some people are still on daylight savings. I mean, sometimes we all get together and publicly talk about nothing in, for a long time. I won't say what that was. But for 24 hours? Yeah. For, for, 
Is this, is it too soon? Is the wound still fresh? It's a little fresh. It's finally getting better. But I do remember people saying, I would show up for nothing but pre-show banter. Like there was people who would say, if you only had pre-show banter, we're like, oh yeah? All right. Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. How much do you love it? We're gonna call your bluff. <laughs> I remember Michael Allen though he was like people watch that like people yeah. watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of what I thought going into it I was like okay this this will be kind of okay but it was freaking <laughs> awesome it really was, um, it was fun. and like I told that's Deb it's kind of a mixture between like MSNBC the Hallmark Channel and Saturday Night Live <laughs> yeah. um, I mean it was that good yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, there were there were some That's heartfelt good. moments. There were sure. some dashes of rants. Oh, yeah. And... yeah, Keith, when you sent that, I teared up a bit. I was like, yeah. oh, what a great summary of. I was looking for a thumbs down button to put on Keith. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Wow. Wow. You hurt your feelings. I made that. He's still yeah, a little. Hey, you're in a mood today. today. Wait, is it because he mentioned a certain news channel? Because I can tell you about the news if you're interested. I don't. Uh, no, we don't know no, no, no. news. No, no. 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 we only talk about the news on the news on Mondays and it's info sectors. Not news itself, but news as in the news itself. Like, no, as in no. Everything. We don't want to so know. Actually, hey, BB King is here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Topic change. Oh, BB. Wow. wow. They're explaining the meta game with the news. It's yeah, you're only making a point. The information the... science that Derek is trying to discuss, but of course, you want to listen. Hi, BB. Oh, BB. Hello. Hello. If you didn't go to talk, it's not like the uh, um, the videos are posted yet. I assume they will be one day. So. The, the videos from the 24 hour pre-show banter mm -hmm. content? No, 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 the oh, uh, okay. Wild West Hackfest. So at Wild West Hackfest, I, we had a speaker back out and I did a presentation on a non-information security topic. And it was about the news. And I really got more feedback and questions about that than I've ever gotten from any information security talk, which was kind of it was, was it about the news as news or about like current topics? Oh gosh, um, now, you've got, now you're getting them started. Yeah. So, all right. So the too long didn't read version was I took a, a, a million news articles. I took a sample of all those and did some NLP, natural language processing and machine learning and came to a conclusion about the news as a whole. So, oh, nice. Okay. I, I'm going sentiment, to divert. Sentiment analysis, right? Yeah, I'm going to di yeah. mm -hmm. divert to a new topic, but along the same lines, Derek, you downloaded and you still didn't write a blog, and that's fine. You got a lot going on. Uh, but you downloaded, what, 400 gigs? It was 300 your, gigs compressed. 300 um, gigs compressed of your data that Google has on you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the very last of the 300 files is 300 files zip archive. So it's 299 uh, file, well, no, it's 299 like zip files, and the last file was like eight gig or so, and that was all of my email not compressed. So my email wasn't, included in that and so which which is fun because i've only owned an android phone for about like maybe a year or so of like you know me having a smartphone maybe, maybe two years but the rest of the time i've had an iphone and um yeah i just thought that was a lot of data so to answer your question i started looking at it and it's so like i'd have to decompress it all and make sense of the structure and i i shelved it as a project but you are right one day i should look at that well, like when you started explaining how Google had 300 gigs on you, and I was like, wait, what? And you even talked about how there were some things, pictures, photos that had nothing to do with an Android device that ended up in your Google data. Yeah. Well, yeah, probably because uh, Google service is on my iPhone, right? Like I would think. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what's in all that data, right? And then, you know, heavy Google users, like, yeah. uh, it's, I, I I would think it would be interesting to go through what they give you to like see if you could kind of go down the road of like what kind of models they're making on everyone because for you know for all of those on the call that don't know my opinion on it like they're not selling your data right the big tech companies don't sell your data they sell access to mathematical models to target advertising to you and it actually gets kind of creepy right and like you hear people tell say stories like well I said something and my phone picked it up and it started advertising to me. And I don't know that that's true, but that just happened to my wife and I. We had a friend pass away and we were in the car talking about a suit. 
because uh, she forgot that I had purchased a suit when my grandmother passed away pre-pandemic, and it's been in the closet ever since. And so I was like, well, I have a suit to wear. And we were just talking about a suit. And then when we got home, she sat on the couch flipping through Instagram or whatever, and there were advertisements for men's suits for her. Mm -hmm. like, okay. So she did not right. Google that at any point. So mm -hmm. creepy. I, I don't know. It could be coincidence, right? But uh, no, same thing happens to me. Yeah, yeah. all the time. Over and over. My husband was walking through airport lobby and him and a friend were talking about bidets for some reason. He started getting bidet ads. They're awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's, that's really creepy. And I say that with, you know, full, full disclosure, there is a, a device. I won't say the keyword because then they'll definitely start listening. You know, I have in my office that is very convenient, but I don't know. The more and more I learn about, uh, what you can do with AI and machine learning, what's being done with it. And I mean, I don't know for sure, right? I don't work at those those companies, but I don't know that I like it, right? And I'm you now Ethan's probably going to laugh because I'm contemplating, you know, ditching Windows again and going back to Linux as my primary OS, oh. just because Microsoft just, is the player in the surveillance capitalism nonsense too. Mm -hmm. I want to circle back to something you said earlier and s just say, hey, Alexa, order 200 rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to. Look, I'm going to plug the thing. There's like eight people right now. Like... <laughs> so much I don't even need this much. I don't think Alexa's in my you will. You will. You will eventually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Well, we got Troy in the chat. Uh, we have Heather in the chat. We have Maxwell Smart in the chat. And frozen, frozen glow, frozen glow, frozen glow. Frozen glow. Frozen. Yeah, it's good to see. You. And someone just left. Was it Ethan? No, it's Derek. Oh God, <laughs> where's Derek? <laughs> Didn't he just say I'm gonna go unplug something? <laughs> yeah. I think Alexa turned his internet off. Yeah. yeah they're like, yeah, he said something about uh, uh, Microsoft capitalist surveillance and like they shut off. Oh, they're back. He's back. All right, good. Boom. Uh, do, do we have slides yet? Are we working on them? I, I had to go apologize real quick. And so uh, it makes perfect uh, sense. Now we're on good terms again. I, I, I did some quick, uh, you know, scrolling through some pictures and stuff on Instagram and fed the model some. So uh, <laughs> you got to feed yeah. the data machine. So Maxwell was smart, just posted the how to purge Google and start over part one. That was written by Mike Felch at some point because Mike ran into some issues with Google uh, due to the nature of the work that we do. And so because of that, uh, he realized how much Google is a part of your life. And so he went on a quest to rid Google from his life. And if you read the blog, it's a two part blog because it is that much things. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you get a chance to read it, it is just so good. I would need a detailed plan whiteboarded out just to ditch my Gmail account. Mm. It's actually not as hard. I've I've done it a couple times. Sorry, yeah. it's not as hard as you think. Oh no, no, I'm just saying all the things that were like I have signed up for that. I'd have to go to, like change all that. I've yeah, I'd, just, I'd have to like make a list. <laughs> Check it twice. Yeah, so the biggest one for me for email that I found is that just getting your own email domain, like buy something really cheap and then use that forever as opposed to like at Gmail or some other service. That way you never get tied to that service, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the future, it doesn't matter what the domain is, it could be something super short and just something memorable. You can use that for the rest of your life and you know pay very little amounts of money to have the privilege of never being stuck into one service. So it's uh, just the way after it. That's the way it well, used to be. You know? Something like mayfamilyx.com and whatever you want to do. Yeah. Um, and then you can move that around. Almost all the providers that are out there allow you to use a custom domain. Uh, even Apple now allows you to do use one now. And so, but you don't have to stay with that provider at some point. You can just go somewhere else and use that domain. So, without so you changing can stand your, up your own server, is that what you do, Ralph? No, don't do that. Don't do that. I, I, that's I, a terrible that, idea. That's a terrible idea. Out of all the ideas, don't do that one. I've done it. Not worth it. it it's hell. Just, Just pay uh, Proton Mail or something. Yeah. Any, so, anyone. Okay. I saw. I logged into my Cloudflare account the other day, and I saw they have a new thing on that side. It's like beta, and they're gonna, yeah, have allow email forwarding. So like you plug in your own domain, like Ralph was saying, and you can just 
have it forwarded then to whatever provider that you want. And mm. that, you know, nice. you, that sounds you nice. Way, you can set up addresses as forwarders to go anywhere. And then when you change who's your back end provider, maybe you use Gmail, but the address that you publish is not a Gmail address, it just forwards there. Then if you want to get off Gmail, you don't have to change yeah. all of your accounts everywhere. GMX. Yeah. yeah, Troy, GMX, that's the one to use. <laughs> BB, your mic is now the worst mic on the planet because yeah, Tim. Okay, mm -hmm. Worst in what way? It just sounds like you're far away and it's uh, not a one or something. Yeah, a tunnel. Is it's, that any better? I don't. No, I don't no. think it's using your lavier. I would say it's selected yeah. the wrong one. I think. Mm -hmm. Go to webinar. All right, everybody. Uh, this is not the webcast. The webcast will begin in 20 minutes. We call this pre-show banter. We show up early because you show up early. You show up early because we show up early. And that is a vicious cycle. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. If you're new to Black Hills Information Security, we show up about 30 minutes before the webcast every single time. And someone at one point said, hey, I love the pre-show banter. You should do it. just do the whole thing, pre-show banter. And we we're like, really? Uh, and so a couple of weeks ago, we did the 24-hour pre-show banter conathon which was 24 straight hours of pre-show banter. I got 22 minutes of sleep and it was by accident, um, but uh, <laughs> but we did it. Uh, we were so traumatized that we didn't live stream or do anything for about a month after. Uh, so if we do it again next year, it will be different. It's so good for productivity. 48 hours. <laughs> yeah, you said you people just keep showing up earlier college. and earlier. <laughs> Oh, oh, I I for the I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> White Cyberduck, he was there for 23 of the 24 hours. That is true. Where's mm. wow. the there crazy there icon for him? I'm looking. So we're hey, on Brian. Discord if you would like to join us. Uh, there's a link to it inside Good Webinar. And if you're like, well, why are you on Discord? And the reason why is because there's going to be a thousand more of you here today. And so we learned a long time ago that some of you like to talk to each other uh, or you like to talk to us or you like to post memes, you like to ask questions and then someone else can answer it. Because uh, as you can see here, there's a bunch of us, uh, but there's a thousand of you. And if a thousand of you ask questions, we can't answer a thousand of you asking questions. And so the community has come together to help answer your questions. Or if you ask a question, you can see that it was asked by someone else and then you can see the answer by someone else. And so uh, this whole community aspect of doing these webcasts and if you're like, really? Yeah, go join Discord, create a user account. If you don't have one, join us on the server. And I'm gonna show you Discord for just a minute in case you're like, well, what does it look like and how do I use it? And some of you are like, well, you've done this a thousand times, Jason. And I was like, I know, but you've been here a thousand times. And so uh, show this window. Yep, just wanna show this window. All right, we got uh, the inverted extrovert right there. There we go. That's what a meme looks like. If you wanna post a meme, you just go down to the GIFs and at this point, uh, we always tell people post a GIF that represents where you're from in the world. And so Deb's probably gonna get to, Darn it, Deb. she got to it I first. Exactly, I, was, I already had it up. <laughs> All right, so we live you know, near each other and so we're gonna use the same one. It's a crab with a knife. Where do you think that is? Where do you think a crab it's with a knife Baltimore, exists? Baltimore, huh? No, don't tell him, I was in the guess. Yeah. Sandy Bottom. That's my guess. Oh, in the game. Not you, you know. So there are many <laughs> discords. There are many discords, like the Wild West Hacking Fest Discord, which is over here. Uh, but my computer's running slow, so it didn't go there immediately. So we have the Wild West Hacking Fest Discord. We are not there today. So if you're in the live chat of the Wild West Hacking Fest Discord, we're not there. Uh, so if you want to go to the Black Hills InfoSec Discord, and we're in the webcast live chat, it will take you five minutes before you can post if you're new to Discord and new to our server. Uh, we did that because there's these things out there called porn bots, and porn bots will hit a server that it's like brand new to, and it goes, "Here's porn everywhere!" And like all of a sudden, you have to like find it and then clean it all up, and it's it's me, right? It's me that has to clean it all up, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there's I'm, somebody posted on Discord a GIF of a rat dragging a slice of pizza downstairs. <laughs> no, I guess it's New York City. New York City. Yeah. New York City. <laughs> oh, CJ, where'd you find that Baltimore one? That was fantastic. <laughs> it's right there on Discord. Oh, right on the internet. Blue. I like oh, that. Hey. I went through the North Carolina thing. Yeah. Someone's got a fellow uh, North Dakota flag. <laughs> 
I, I almost feel that when we show Discord, we should have like a five second delay in case something bad comes up. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the policy is if you post anything bad, you'll be banned for life. That's, oh, life. Oh, plus, no. I mean, oh. let's face it, you can't work in information security for any amount of time and not be exposed to something that someone is going to consider offensive, right? Mm. Like, especially if you do malware analysis. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, gotta, I'm offended by that. I'm yeah, offended. see? Yeah. 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 All right, there are all there are other channels because the Discord's always around. So if you hop in here and you like it, we have the blockchain security channel, we have the incident response channel, cloud security, home labs. Home labs is a very, very active uh, uh and if you ever want to, you can just do a search. You can do a search for whatever it is that you're interested in. And out of the like, I think 172,000 messages that have been posted so far on the server, you might be able to find someone that's already talked about it and then find information about your topic. Tool sharing is really good, but if you post a tool, make sure that you give some kind of like synopsis or like here's what the tool does and here's what it is. Because just because it's a link on Discord doesn't mean it's not potentially malicious and full of phishing mm -hmm. malware and stuff. So be careful. I think I need to schedule my Discord time so I don't get nerd sniped by stuff. That's why I don't come out there very much. Yeah, yeah you know, look at sorry, like, this is interesting, and then after an hour later, I'm like, ah, crap! I was supposed to be doing other shit. <laughs> Jason, you just sent me down a rabbit hole. I don't think I'm gonna make the webcast anymore. See? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Virginia is for PCAP lovers. Oh. Oh, nice, Troy. <laughs> Don't you want to just black out the V and put a big S nice. there or something? <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can go back to full size video for the next 13 minutes. Uh, if you're here oh, early, sorry. this is the webcast. Uh -huh. No, it's not. It's pre show. Man. This is it. You missed it. <laughs> we're going to do uh, real quick. <laughs> we're going to do. We're going to do quick introductions. Uh, just. Like say your name and what you do here at what what would you say you do here at this place that we work? Uh, so we'll start with Keith. Keith, what do you do here? Um, I actually I, I act for countermeasures. Um, I, I actually kind of do a lot of things. My official title is DevOps engineer, but um, that's really just a title. Uh, I don't think I fit into that box at all. But uh, I do both uh, so the web development. I take care of the website for active countermeasures. I do help uh, some of the developers there. I also work on the Black Hill side, uh, doing uh, threat hunting and uh, some of the HDOC services. You do way BB. more than us. <laughs> uh, BB, what do you do here? I um, I select the wrong microphone inputs for my whenever I'm in front that of people. True. You sound <laughs> way better. It's not so how you build. You sound good. Modest. It's better. Well, I, I, uh, I, I teach a web app pen testing class, and when I do that, I check things beforehand, so it's mm. better there. Mm. Um, I'm one of the testers at Black Hills InfoSec, and uh, that means I write a lot of reports. Uh, I actually have two reports right now that I'm working on at the same time, which is my own fault. Um, it happens. Well, I, it happens I can send you some excellent webcasts on that topic, Brian. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. somebody. <laughs> yeah, there's a guy we know uh, works at Black Hills that does webcasts. Awesome. Yeah. Easier on awesome. me. <laughs> he's selling himself short because he's the one who like basically is in charge of our and now I guess what would you say like reporting infrastructure? Like every time I have like something that even deals with like the administrative stuff of a report, I get told I don't know, I go talk to BB. So <laughs> yeah, other BBs that are trying on me. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, if you all don't know, BB is like the glue that holds all of our testers together. Mm -hmm. At least that's what the testers <laughs> tell us about BB. So. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the librarian. If people don't know, where, where is this written down somewhere? I'm like, oh, hang on, got it. <laughs> it's, it's faster than Google internally for stuff. Yeah. Glue. I've never been called the glue before. Um, the glue. I'm going to take We're gonna change your name. The CP of Black Hills Information Security. Sorry. Well, it looks like Ethan just left, so now I'm terrified, but that's fine. Uh, Ralph, what would you say you do here? I just show up to these things uh, mm -hmm. just because I want to hang out with you guys. Um, and then right. I also um, have to write reports. That's like what I get paid to do. But hanging out with you guys, I do it for free every day. Yeah, I, don't, what, what, I don't see you do anything. You mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. That's hey, true. one of the customers going to YouTube. We don't monitor the chat there, do we? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> the no chat there work, is no. disabled. YouTube. No, oh, no. there we go. It's disabled. Okay. So now. Fantastic. Uh, oh, that's right. We have questions inside go to webinar. I forgot all. That was it. Okay. I've right. been handling them. Uh, so one of the things that Ralph has done recently is he told us a story mm -hmm. about a physical pen test that he did at some point in the past that included computer hacking and things like that. Uh, but it's going to be the story that's in the next zine. And so, Deb, if you can post the zine, if you want to get that, you can mm -hmm. sign up for it for free. We will mail it to you for free. If you live in the United States, if you live outside of the United States, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, and as soon as we can find paper to print it on, then we will print it. And Wait, so that's, uh, you'll just publish any old hacking war story? Oh, man. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. So, Jason, Deb, does this uh, webcast make certificates for people? Uh, the go to webinar does, but YouTube does not. YouTube does not. Yeah, that's what we wanted yeah. to make sure to say. If you're watching on yes. YouTube, leave go to webinar open in the background or something so you can get a yeah. certificate if you need that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or so just you did not get a certificate if you watched on YouTube. Uh, Ethan, welcome back. Thanks for being here. Uh, what would you say you do around here? What what would I say I do? Uh, yeah, what would you say you do around here? Uh, what would you say? I I just goof off. <laughs> Ethan is a bully. No, that's great. No, no, I have fun uh, trying to find threats on networks currently and develop detections for finding threats on networks. That's I, that's basically what I do. So a quick follow up question: How exciting is it? to find a threat in the network. How exciting is it? It's so when there's something weird that you've never seen before, that that's pretty exciting. It's not quite as exciting once you like pull on the thread to get to the end and you realize like oh it's just some dumb enterprise software doing something that it shouldn't really be doing. Like <laughs> it's the inverse of like, pen. Okay, testing. here's here's the here's the <laughs> quintessential example in my mind. Google Chrome, uh, every time it starts up, will make, I think it's three random DNS requests on the local subnet. So it's not like to any .com or anything. It's just like a host name. So whatever your local DNS search space is, there'll be these random DNS requests. So uh, multiply that by how many, um, how many computers are on your network and you've got like a mess of dns logs and it's just super annoying and it also like when it th there's no indication that it's chrome it's just like a random string of characters so the first time i saw this it was very disconcerting but it's documented out there i found in the chromium source code like where it does it it's just really annoying yeah there's a lot of people showing up right now like oh that sounds a like legit is this real threat hunting stuff like did i miss it no uh we still don't start for seven more minutes so this is pre-show banter we're just Even threat hunting is like, ourselves. Mm -hmm. oh it's like the inverse of pen testing in a way where like when you when you're pen testing you try a whole lot of stuff to see what works right when you're threat hunting um most of the time like when you pull on that thread it ends up being something like that right like 99 percent of the time you're like oh well at least we know that now right um, yeah. But that, one, okay. that, that small time that it's for real is is kind of exciting, right? And actually, that you know, we're gonna actually talk about that here in about uh, thirty-seven minutes. We'll get to that point by then. Yeah. Robin shared a link in Discord to what I was talking about, the Google Chrome thing. And mm -hmm. I don't know if that article mentions it, but there's articles out there that are talking about the load that it puts on like root name servers because pe th these requests are supposed to stay internal. They should be like internal DNS space, but they're going out to the internet. And some people are just sending them, like they make it all the way to the root name servers. And it's a non-trivial load that it's putting on like the backbone of the internet, just because Chrome decides wow. that it wants to check if anyone's talking with DNS. So I don't know if anyone's ever seen a whole bunch of uh, unexplained Team Comrie, like hash Team Comrie lookups in your network. If you're running Zeek and you oh. didn't know, like Zeek does that, that by default, right? Yeah, that, that was another one too. That's another one, right? Um, uh, what was it? Oh, uh, Sophos. I worked at a place one time where uh, it did something very similar, like using DNS to do like cheap malware lookups, because it's not going to be blocked, you know, the vast majority of the time, right? 
we actually got our uh, a DNS server, one of our DNS servers blacklisted by, or we got blacklisted by Verizon because we were doing too many lookups because of, of, of that. Like we were apparently getting like no joke, if I have the numbers right, uh, they said we were like 75% of the traffic on that DNS server for Verizon. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. oh. Do <laughs> you think, you know, you know 20,000 systems and uh, all the executables that are getting ran and they're getting looked up and like, yeah. So here's what I've learned by Ethan and Derek talking about these things is that they are very passionate and they love this stuff, which is going to be great for the webcast. Deb, what would you say you do here? Uh, no, I, I'm a community manager. I get to hang out with you lovely people and I, I do get paid to show up for this, Ralph. So I don't, I don't know why you're here, but. I'm here for that. <laughs> Sam, what would you say you do here? <laughs> and his mic is on mute. Damn it. Him, there all, we that go. Good, all that good camera. Yeah, uh, so I'm I'm one of the new reporters uh, slash pen testers. <laughs> so I get to uh, write reports in between finding cool stuff on people's networks. Nice. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Should we? Should we change the titles instead of like security analyst or pen tester? Be security reporter. I like it. Security, security journalist. That way you're on the news. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a yeah. CJ, what would you say you do around here? I take the information from the customer and I get it from the reporter. <laughs> Someone was gonna do it. Someone had to. <laughs> Seriously, that was my first. Job. That was my first job. Then John said it's to keep the plate spinning. And now it's to put out fires. So, that's <laughs> but we don't have fires, so you have like nothing to do, right? What? Who? What? <laughs> yeah, let's now let's not be transparent now. <laughs> now let's just hide some of this stuff. Out of all the things, yeah. <laughs> and Ryan, uh, the the most silent, quiet person in the group. Ryan, what do you? What would you say you do here? What would I say I do? Well, I do. <laughs> video things, I do streaming, I do some editing, little of this, little of that. Mm -hmm. I run the newscast on Mondays at 4.30 Eastern time. Okay. Uh, Derek, I, we didn't get to... I've always been good with your name. Do, do you duel people? Do you do dueling? <laughs> oh, no. no. The, uh, that name was given to me by, by John Strand because of my photography background. Um, oh, nice. okay. I get it. I get it now. VHF side, we have the handles, which I came up with mine, Ryan. I'm going to be the rainmaker. The rainmaker. Nice. Yeah. Rainmaker. I like it. <laughs> I'm the <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then my name is Jason Blanchard. I'm the content community director at Black Hills Information Security, and that means I produce and create content, build and foster community. Two of those things are the Zine, and so if you haven't checked out the Zine yet, please sign up for that. It is free, like it's free. We just want to mail it to you. We want people to see it and read it. And we want you to like do it the old school paper version because it just feels better. And if you, for some reason, don't think paper should be used for things like that, that's fine. Uh, you can still get it digitally. Uh, the other thing that we do is backdoors and breaches. And so if you haven't played backdoors and breaches, uh, that's a game that we created for incident response tabletops. Uh, so it's backdoors and breaches. And we have two minutes, two minute warning. Uh, but we have a free, version of backdoors and breaches if you go to play.backdoorsandbreaches.com which deb's going to put up into the chat uh, you can totally play for free you don't have to buy a deck but if you do want to get your i, I want to make sure i enunciate this if you want to get your deck by the holidays now is the time to order them that doesn't look uh, if you would like to get them for you and your team yes i have to enunciate all right we got one minute that means everyone who's not going to be talking, please go ahead and kill your cameras and microphones, which should just leave me with Derek and Ethan. Thank you all for joining us for the pre-show banter. We have the slides up, which is fantastic. They're in some kind of weird Linux thing, I believe. And so we don't have the ability to give them to you. And so if you ask for the slides, I can't do it because Derek and Ethan were like, hey, let's do this thing in Linux. Uh, and then they didn't know how to give us a PDF of this thing that they put in Linux. And so we'll eventually get them to you. And I wasn't throwing them under the bus. I was explaining what happened so that way when people ask the question.
I mean, Jason, I, Jason, you yeah. should know better. This this is what I did for my last webcast too. I know. As soon as Derek's like, I think Ethan did a thing, and I was like, oh, like last time. Yeah. Ethan talked me into it, and you also skipped me. What do I do here? I do other duties as a sign, but uh, I'm Please. transitioning for uh, uh, from primarily pen testing and some incident response to mostly incident response and threat hunting and maybe a sprinkle or two of pen testing here or there. So. Sprinkle. Speaking of which, it is one o'clock. It is time to get started. Thank you for joining us for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. My name is Jason Blanchard. We have Derek Banks and Ethan Robich with us. If you showed up for the pre-show banter, thanks for doing that. Uh, we do it every single time. But today, if you want to ask a question, we highly recommend you do it in Discord. And the reason why we ask you to do it in Discord is because other people will be able to help answer your question because there's only a few of us and there's over, I think right now, a thousand of you. So it will be helpful if you ask those questions there. If you want to ask the questions to go to webinar, you totally can. And uh, there's a few of us that are assigned to try to answer those questions the best we can. But if at some point we need to interrupt Derek and Ethan to ask for clarifying things, we will do so. And with that, Derek and Ethan, I'm going to turn it over to you, to the audience. If you ever need a pen test, red team, active sock, or any of that, you know where to find us. And I'm out. That's all you. Sweet. Well, hey, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, the I'm assuming slides are in the background, Derek. There you go. Ah, ah, there we go. How's how's it now? Uh, I, I see the presenter mode still in front. Mm. Okay, hang on. We we did prepare. <laughs> uh, we did test this. Okay, hang on, just one second here. It's okay. Well, this is my opportunity to say thank you once again for joining us as Ethan and Derek figure out how to share the slides. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in Discord or go to webinar. Oh, I love the blank screen. That's fantastic. And now just video. Do you want me to try it, Derek? No, I got it. I mean, okay. this worked just a minute ago. This is what happens when you do something different, right? Mm -hmm. So hang on one second. Um, do you think the ransomware people are trying to keep you from saying all the things that you're about to say? Mm, no, we don't really mention ransomware so much. Just, just your dogs. <laughs> That's not my dog. <laughs> all right, one second. Sorry, everyone talk amongst yourselves. Okay. All right, so. Time's up. I like the uh, the Christmas decorations you have in the background, Jason. Uh, thank you. Getting on, um, getting on the early. I don't know if anyone noticed it is prior to Thanksgiving. If you're watching the recording, then it's whenever it is for you. Uh, but Ethan, if you want to like ad lib the first slide, how would you introduce the talk that we're about to do today? Yeah, sounds great. So the title is looking for needles in needle stacks with the threat hunting toolkit. So looking for needles in needle stacks kind of alludes to the threat hunting portion. That's kind of how we feel like the process of threat hunting goes. <laughs> it's not needles in haystacks, because that's different. You have to look for something that looks just like all the other stuff. And the toolkit, the part of the name, threat hunting toolkit, we'll, we'll get to that later. But basically, it's a suite of tools, to a toolkit, if you will, to that, um, that I mainly developed to help us Streamline the, the threat hunting process. Um, there's some nice features that it gives us. I got tired of doing the same boilerplate stuff all the time, so I just kind of made it so that all that go away. But, and if we, that takes us through the title slide, which you can't see. So the next slide is just a little bit about us. Um, I'm Ethan. Derek is the one in the green shirt. And he looks so hunters. like he's diligently working too. Just look yeah, at the, the eye yeah. tracking, the yeah. screens are changing, the stuff is now? happening. Uh, you're not sharing your screen now, so. It says I'm uh, sharing. We see two well, instances of it. Um, that's close, right? Just need to move one over and then hit next. No, that's not, I'm telling it to show the application. All right, Ethan, you do it. I don't know, I don't know what happened. All right, you're gonna have to, I'll rely on you for the speaker notes then. Yeah, it's fine. I'm making Ether presenter. And this is when we find out he's on a Linux machine and can't share. I, I am not because GoToWebinar does not work with Linux. That is correct. Yes. 
<sighs> okay, how's that? Technical looks difficulties. Great. That one looks like it's supposed to look. All right, moving on. All right. Okay, so yeah, about us, Derek, Ethan, Threat Hunters of Black Hills. Um, we'll share more details at the end, but honestly, if, if you're still here and interested, then that's that's when you'll probably be more interested in who we are. Yeah. So, right. uh, so, so oh, go ahead, you do it. All right. The, yeah, the roadmap, uh, which Jason already kind of asked about. So we're gonna cover kind of our what we view threat hunting as. Um, threat hunting, that definition for threat hunting is kind of a highly contentious topic. And we're just gonna cover some of the viewpoints out there and our take on it. And then we're gonna go over the types of data sources that we work with. And then we're gonna focus in on one and do like go through an example um, threat hunt that we did where we found a C2 channel in a, in a real network. So, so what, is, uh, what is threat hunting, Derek? Yeah, so um, this is actually one of my uh, favorite definitions that we found. We went looking for what other people thought threat hunting was, and uh, I like brevity, and so a proactive approach to identifying threats. And you notice that proactive is bolded. As we go through some of these, we're going to kind of bold some common threads, uh, you know, some like poor man's NLP or semantic analysis. What's common with all of this? Yeah, so we got uh, proactive again, human driven. This is like the inverse of the first one where it's a whole lot more wordy, not brief at all. Uh, iterative search through networks and endpoints. Uh, the activities that have evaded detection is an important uh, part. You'll see in the next one, evade security, existing security monitoring tools. You're proactively looking, proactive. So we've got unknown threats that you're proactively looking for. That's what I think these definitions are summed up to. So yeah, I like this one because it's it's a it's different wording, but really, if you look at the words that are, we've got bolded, it's kind of saying the same thing. Act as early as possible. It's just another way, say, way of saying be proactive. And this is probably our favorite definition of them all. I mean, Derek's at the first one, but really, this this one kind of takes the cake. It, it encompasses all the other things because that's really what we're doing, right? We're kind of just messing around on the network and seeing what we can find. All right. So the common things that we we can pull out of those definitions are, again, it's proactive. It's finding things that existing tooling miss. We're not, um, threat hunting isn't like responding to IDS alerts. Um, that's more, that could move into like incident response maybe. But so, I think the other common theme that Derek and I have run into is you've got a huge amount of data that you're sorting through and you need to find some special subset of that data. So all of the no matter what your definition is, you're you're going to be you're going to be filtering or funneling down into a smaller subset of data. If you're collecting logs right, if you're gathering even on medium-sized networks and what you would consider a small network, um, you can get a lot of data pretty quickly. And so how do you make sense of that? And that's what we're going to talk about. And this is uh, kind of a, let's see, what's what did I call this earlier? I'm not sure that I get the right uh, definition. It is the uh, uh, data science threat yes, hunting science. funnel of awesomeness. <laughs> yep, sounds right. <laughs> OK. Um, so we'll kind of walk through this. Uh, we took this uh, from Austin Taylor, uh, who had a, a really neat blog uh, post on kind of the same thing, where uh, we're going to talk mainly about network traffic in terms of what we're looking at. But uh, this could apply to any any real data set. You have your normal stuff, things that are you know, normal activity. And then if you do some kind of uh, processing here, machine learning is what is being used in terms of finding something anomalous. There are other methods that aren't necessarily machine learning that you could find anomalies uh, in, in, and that's what they are. Notice we're not saying that they're malicious, they're anomalies. If you were here for the pre-show banter, we already made the point that 99% of the time when you're threat hunting, you're probably not finding something malicious. You're probably finding something that's you know normal, just weird, right? And then how do you make that from anomalous to interesting? Well, you uh, if you've done any kind of data science, uh, you'll, you'll notice that uh, or you'll know that domain knowledge is really important. So you take the anomaly detection and the domain knowledge, and that's how you end up with finding something that's potentially bad. All right, so I jumped the gun a little bit, but these, right. these are the, 
the modern threat hunting challenges that we so that on modern networks the things that we run into that make our jobs as threat hunters harder um, so traffic volume is one of them like as you get more and more data it takes longer and takes more processing power and it takes more sophisticated ways to sort through that data um, along with that like if you've got logs with kind of disseparate um, applications like network logs host logs that, um, those are separate and you can you can search them separately but correlating them together into like a unified place i mean that's that's kind of what a sim is meant to do but that that's also a challenge um again compounded by the the volume and attackers honestly are more sophisticated than they used to be um there's a lot of more well-known ways and like the tooling is more mature for hiding in what's normal in existing networks you've got that compounded again with uh everyone moving remotely um, in the last couple of years so remote workforces which makes logging more difficult and it makes determining what a new normal is uh, a new challenge and then some things coming up and more in the future as adoption increases uh, cloud obviously I, I guess that's it's kind of here already but it's different from the traditional on-premise network environment and the trend is moving towards encrypted traffic so tls 1.3 and where that kind of throws a wrench in is with its um, feature of having an encrypted server name in indicator so one of the things we can pull out of um, ssl traffic as you'll see in our example later is the server name field which is great because on the network level you just know an ip address but if that ip address is going to a system that um, that belongs to a cdn or a big name like Google or whatever, it, it's helpful to know what domain is associated with that. And the server name indicator gives us that with SSL traffic. And then DNS over TLS, HTTPS, I saw that already mentioned in Discord earlier. So, I mean, these are things we are all aware of, but it's just things that we're going to have to develop uh, tools and methodologies around to address. So one of the ways that we've been approaching threat hunting recently is what we're calling hypothesis-based threat hunting, which a lot of folks probably do call it something else, but um, that essentially it works like this. We have a question of interest, uh, uh, sort of like if you're doing a hypothesis test in statistics, right? You have a question of interest that you want to prove or disprove based on the data. So you know, let's say that we wanted to uh, find uh, SMB traffic that met a certain criteria. Well, we'd come up with the data and the technique that we're going to use, and we might uh, do something like uh, stack all connections from most to least frequent, or um, try and find some outlier like based on files, transmission size, or you know something along those lines. We might take all of our data and compare it to another set of data using set theory, uh, or like we're going to do here in a minute, uh, we're going to look for beaconing, and and we're actually not going to be using math. If anybody was expecting math, there's a lack of math in this presentation. Yeah. I wouldn't say we're doing the traditional beaconing, but it's there's definitely some similarities. True, true. We're not doing beaconing detection. We're finding something that we're finding something that uh, has an artifact because of the beaconing. Yes. All right. So we mentioned data sources and. I guess really the big three that come to mind are host-based data. So that'd be, you know, Windows endpoint logs. It wouldn't have to be Windows, but that's the majority of people's networks. Um, network logs and then Active Directory. And again, that's more Windows-centric, but honestly, mo most places have some form of Active Directory and they're either using LDAP or they have, you know, some, some directory of accounts and authentication somewhere. Um, and then there's various other types that kind of like can be useful, but I would say are more supplementary. Do you have any more to add on that, Derek? Um, no, I, I would just say that, you know, in terms of the AD stuff, I mean, most everyone listening probably has Active Directory or some form. I, all the time I've been at Black Hills, I think I've seen two customers that did not. Um, so. That's a that's a pretty small statistic. Um, 
So, you know, some of the things that you'll find in uh, host uh, or ways to get host-based logs. Uh, host-based logs, we're, we're you know, talking about it as a data source. We're going to be looking at, at Zeek logs, but host-based logs are important in a modern uh, threat hunting scenario because, as Ethan mentioned before, a lot of the workforce is, is more and more remote. And so um, while you can force all the network traffic, you know, back through a central uh, funneling point with VPNs or you know, other type of technology, um, it's not necessarily always going to fit your user base, right? And so getting, you know, the, your network edge, your, your network has been pushed out to the, the edge, you know, the endpoint for a while now. And so, you know, some of the things that you want to look for in a host based log, you know, process execution, you know, network connections that are being made, like authentication, that type of stuff. We're big fans of Sysmon because it's, you know, doesn't cost much and it's pretty effective. And uh, there are other things out there like OS query. I've never used Waza. Um, and then your, your EDR, if you have an EDR, should be giving you telemetry past alerting, right? You should be able to get activity on on what's happening on, on an endpoint. Yeah. Some of those examples, the, the process execution and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. So the pros, I think Derek's kind of basically covered this, but the pros, we have increased visibility um, versus some of the other the other um, logging sources. And really, they, I don't know, this, this could probably be a pro for each one of them. Each one of them gives you a different view, I would say. Yeah. Into what might otherwise be a blind spot. And um, one thing that's uh, not quite spelled out in the cons that you know we, we've actually seen recently is sometimes when machines are remote, they have trouble uh, always checking in. So that's a, a hurdle that needs to be overcome. Is if you have a remote worker and they're not connecting, you know, to, if they, if you don't have a way for that machine to talk without being, you know, to the to the central location of, you know, log repository without being VPN in and they never VPN in and you're not getting the telemetry, right? So. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to point out the first con can be difficult to deploy. This is really organization specific because traditionally you think like an agent based um, logging mechanism is more difficult to deploy because it means touching every single endpoint. But some places are instrumented well enough where it, it, like if you got centralized management, centralized deployment, you've got some of these problems like the the checking in problem Derek was talking about, like figured out, it could honestly be almost easier to deploy it, to, to deploy the endpoint logs than it would be to set up like a span port on your network sensor or on a, on a network sensor. So it really depends on your network, your environment, you know, what what's going to come easiest, what's what's the path of least resistance. <clears throat> So uh, when we mentioned Active Directory earlier, you know, some of the uh, examples of, of log files or sorry, of log data would be authentication attempts, more process logging, event IDs that uh, are, are from the actual domain. Um, and then and if you're doing it in Azure, I just realize it might cost you a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit extra money to get to the right yeah, logging. Like the E5 license level, right? It's kind of the the golden target. Yeah. So one of the uh, the pros, though, um, I, I think that if you're doing threat hunting and an incident response, and you're not taking into account, um, you, you know, logging in your Windows environment and ingesting them to a central source and looking for specific IDs and patterns of stuff, then you really need to because you need to essentially baseline what's normal and look for things, look for patterns of of, of abuse. Um, one of the drawbacks, though, is in a mixed environment, and it's really only one picture of, of your network, right? If you have a mixed environment with some Linux and, you know, sprinkled in, then you, you have to have a different, you know, strategy for that or if you're on Mac laptops. And, um, you know, and interesting and maybe, you know, like I wouldn't say debatable point now, but certainly in the past, right? Like, you know, Windows logging um, was not really meant for security. Um, Anybody who ever even uses Event Viewer knows that, right? Like this is not the most efficient way to view this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So then we get to probably our favorite log source, but I mean we're biased. Um, Virginia's and, uh, network, networks, right? So Virginia's for PCAP lovers, yeah. 
so the gold standard in our mind, I think, is Zeek, and that's the first uh, log source listed here. But there are limitations to network logs, which we kind of alluded to earlier. So you don't you don't have visibility of um, what caused something like on an endpoint. Like you can see the result, you can see a network connection, you can see where it's going, um, but you don't know what caused it. You don't know the context around it, and um, the with the modern challenges with encryption, like you have less and less information as we as we go forward. So it's it's something that's going to have to evolve, and we'll have to you know cross multiple disciplines or multiple data sources going forward. Yeah, um, you know encryption, that encrypting thing. More and more encryption is a challenge, right? And the good old you know monitoring your network or farting around on the network days, there was a whole lot of uh, HTTP going on. Not so much anymore. And so you know you you have to start relying on other things like metadata about the uh, you know the encrypted connections and 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 things that are kind of surrounding that. Um, but you know, in terms of network log, you know, log sources overall, um, it's hard to hide from an upstream network collector in a general sense, right? Like you have to pass over the wire. Now it might be encrypted, um, but there really are some great options out there uh, aside from Zeek. Uh, we like Zeek just because um, uh, of the ability to go to the actual log files, like the data that's there, and work at the command line and um, one of the problems with monitoring your network in such a way, especially if you go down the full PCAP route, is hardware and storage costs. Uh, it can get expensive if you're doing full PCAP. I think we actually have a graphic for that coming next, right? Yeah, I, I yeah. wanted to point out, um, it's not specifically spelled out here, but the IoT thing. So someone mentioned in Discord, network is the great equalizer. Uh, quote attributed to Chris Brenton. So he's he's exactly right. And there's there's cases like IoT where it's the only log source you're gonna have. Like you, yeah. you, you basically don't know what's on your network and or on your environment unless you look at your network logs. So yeah you know, we already we already kind of um, said the punchline here, but the <laughs> different network log sources that we like. Uh, so NetFlow has its pros and cons. It's probably has the least amount of storage requirements, but uh, we have some experience like working with different vendors implementations of NetFlow, and it's not super nice. Consistent. Also, also it was meant for. I think it was originally designed for like network troubleshooting, that kind of thing. It's not really meant for security, although it. I mean, it, it's useful. It's just. It's not better than nothing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think I've heard said before, NetFlow is the best uh, information source you didn't know you had, right? Like, I think, I don't know if John said that or somebody, but it's true, right? Because sometimes you can, depending on your inf infrastructure, you can just turn that on, right? Um, yeah. But, so full packet capture is something that in the past was certainly near and dear to my heart. Uh, I actually wrote a white paper on it years and years ago. It's probably not quite as relevant unless you, you know, really want to make one from scratch out of Linux, these days there's probably better options to do. Um, but you know, the, the great thing is, is you get everything. You, if you had a question about what happened on the network, it's all gonna be there. It might, you know, again with encryption issues, but it's all there. But the drastic uh, storage requirements might be a little more than you're willing to, to, to handle. And uh, we have some metrics coming up, but, now, on a, a decent sized network, you're talking about terabytes a day, right? Like that that's what you're gonna get. And so you you have to have the ability to store tens, hundreds of terabytes pretty easily. And also not on cheap disks, right? They can't be slow spinny disks. So you neither either you write it to a RAM disk or um or put it uh you know in uh you know on solid state disks. And then also it can be time consuming to, to go through, right? Like if you use something like ngrep, ngrep on you know big repository PCAPs, good luck. You need yeah. to you need to pre-filter your search categories while you're like capturing, right? Like you would roll over the PCAP and then you would 
process some kind of indexing and then you have to search the index, right? You're not think, searching through the, the PCAP library itself. Right. I think there's some tools out there that help with that. They do exactly what you're talking about, like some Google Stenographer indexes yeah. into PCAPs well, to, and then, to help you know, with the, Zeke, the searching. Zeke does something similar, but you know, one, one thing that's neat about TCP dump, again, if you're rolling it yourself, which, you know, it's probably not as bad as doing your own email server, but your own full PCAP thing is doable. There's actually a switch in TCP dump that uh, was meant to, uh, it's this capital Z switch, I think, that uh, will run anything, any kind of executable or script or whatever after the PCAP gets created. And then mm -hmm. so you could potentially, you, you could do it with TCP dump, but again, you know, popsicle sticks and, and bubble gum, right? <laughs> Yeah. All right. So again, coming to our favorite data source, Zeek, uh, we feel it's it's kind of the happy medium. It gets enough visibility into what's going on without uh, going into a full packet capture mode. Um, and there's pros pros and cons, straight offs to each. But like we said, it's it's a great happy medium. And this is this is kind of a so thank thank you Troy for the graphic. Yeah, and, and Troy's in our reference slide. If you want to have a see an entire presentation on the nuances of of network capture and uh, how to go about it, uh, then uh, Troy's Bros Before Flows talk uh, is a good place to start. All right, so we're kind of revisiting the graphic that we covered earlier. So you've got all this data. We we just covered you know all all sorts of different data sources. Now now what do you do? And the answer is you gotta you gotta funnel it down somehow. You need to pick some hypothesis, if you will, and use that to get rid of anything that's not relevant to your hypothesis, and just start whittling it down until you get to something that is possible to go through manually or to to do deeper inspection into. And kind of the main way that we do this these days is with um, the threat hunting toolkit. I mean, obviously, this is just one tool among many. We use a lot of great tools. Um, people have been talking about Security Onion, which is fantastic. Um, AC Hunter, which we definitely use. So I, I think one valid point to that is, you know, other tools are great. They're just different lenses and windows. And um, I think a, a good point to make that the, the flexibility of THT, I think when you use Zeek, you're going to end up looking through the log files at the command line, right? Like you're going to do that. Yeah. Um, at some point. Really what THT is centered around is uh, plain text log parsing, processing. So it has a lot of nice things that are Zeek specific, but it works for generic delimited files like CSV, JSON, or JSON files as well. Um, and it it's, it's not like, I don't know how to, convey this, but it's it's not a single tool. So Threat Hunting Toolkit, as the name implies, is like an entire toolkit. So you actually, when you install it, you're downloading kind of a wrapper script that just puts you into a, another environment. So it's actually distributed as a Docker image that comes with a whole bunch of tools already installed. And kind of the main purpose, or the main reason this came about was because, so at Black Hills, we have threat hunting engagements where we go into a customer's network and we have to bring everything with us to uh, like all our tooling and stuff. And I got tired of installing the same tools over and over again, or on the flip side, using the built-in Linux tools, which are super powerful, but there's a ton of boilerplate and just weird special command line flags and stuff that you'd have to do to parse, to, like to be efficient and do the, the things that we're doing with the Zeek logs and whatnot. All right, so let's let's get into the nitty gritty. Derek, tell tell us about our example hunt that we're going to go through. Yeah, so we're going to go through an example that uh, was probably you know uh, it was as real world as as you can get, right? Like we have we're doing a threat hunt live in a customer network, and um, there was active C two. Um, the the reason I know that is because uh, uh, Ethan and Sam they were doing the uh, threat hunt while uh, Joff and I, we were the attacker. So we were actually running an engagement simultaneously. And uh, I, I promise you, we did not tell Sam and Ethan a thing. In fact, the client was treating it like a game, right? Like, you know, you've got this service we purchased, go find them, right? 
And so, well, challenge accepted. And so, our hypothesis is that uh, there is active command and control on our network. And we're going to start with that. And so, you know, as with all hypotheses, we're going to make some assumptions, right? You know, how do how do attackers generally hide? Well, one of the common things that we do at Black Hills, and you know, I've seen other attackers do in some form or fashion, is we'll use like a relay of some sort. Our our back end C2 server is never really exposed. And one of the ones we like to use is, is CloudFront. And uh, and so that, that's the starting point. All right, so to really get into this, we have to know what normal looks like. And CloudFront is a CDN. It's used everywhere. So chances are you're going to see some of it on your network if you looked right now. And even better chances are you're going to see a lot of it. <laughs> if you tried to block CloudFront because you're like, because you heard in a webcast that people use it for uh, C2 channels. Don't do that. Your, your, your internet's not going to work anymore. Uh, so Derek actually informed me it could, you can you can send unencrypted HTTP to CloudFront as well, but the typical usage we see is with SSL. Um, and what the domains actually look like, so this uh, it's kind of a random string. They all seem to start with D, but otherwise it's just random characters afterwards, which doesn't mean anything. It's not like you can say my widget shop dot cloudfront.net. Like you, yeah. there's no descriptive. This is a great case of of why sometimes atomic indicators of compromise don't work, right? Like if you thought that, let's just say that this this CloudFront domain was malicious, yeah, you could block that. It's trivial to make a new one, right? Like it, it will do you no good to block that entire domain. Yeah. One thing that we should note though is that, so while this domain is random, it is tied to a specific, I'm not going to forget, the, I'm not going to get the right terminology, but I'm just going to say customer. So it's if, if you are looking at something so like traffic to this, you know that it's not mixed in with other unrelated things. Like if, if it's going to Acme, like say this belongs to Acme Inc., which you don't know ahead of time, but you start looking into it, you can be reasonably well assured that like, Bob's coffee shop isn't also like in this traffic. <laughs> so what kind of uh, anomalies would we be looking for with, you know, with this kind of traffic profile? Like Ethan mentioned, you can send HTTP, but we'll just make the assumption that an attacker is going to use encrypted traffic. I mean, I think that's a fairly safe assumption. I think most people probably just default to HTTPS for everything now, right? So that's a fair assumption to make. Um, so we could potentially look for domains that are are new that we haven't seen before um, uh, in, in terms of our data lake of network of, of Z clogs, right? Um, we can look for something that's potentially abnormal in terms of volume or you know numbers of requests or or you know and we'll talk about this in a second, but kind of a a most frequent or least frequent amount of current occurrence, uh, looking at those two tails, uh, the short tail and the long tail of data can tell you interesting things sometimes. And then another thing that's uh, specific to Zeek is, uh, I don't think it's on by default now, is it Ethan? I think you still have to turn it on. Is what this is thing it? called a Java 3 hash? Oh yeah, it's a it's a plugin you have to enable. Yeah. Install. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what a JAW3 hash uh, is at the, in, a, in a little bit, um, but just look, think of it as like a unique indicator for certain for, for encrypted traffic. Yeah, I, I should mention a lot of implementations of Zeek. So like if you install Security Onion that comes with Zeek, it will all it will have the JAW3 plugin already there. Similarly, like when we deploy AC Hunter, it's already got the JAW3 plugin installed and enabled. All right, so again, possible anomalies, newly observed CloudFront domain, abnormal traffic, rare JAW3 hash. Those are the three we're going to kind of cover. So the first one, newly observed domains. How, how, would we, how do we approach this? So first of all, how, how do we know if a domain is new on our network? Like if it's, how is it, how do we know if it's newly observed? We could, we could just straight, straight up search through historical log records and find the first instance of it. That's that's definitely doable and that's possible, but that's going to take time. 
So another another way you can do it, um, which involves pre-processing into a passive DNS database. So basically you're taking all your logs and actually I, I won't go over passive DNS. I think that's the next next slide, but searching through historical logs is think think grep or zgrep or something like that. You're you're processing all your logs. Passive DNS is just looking it up into it in a database and getting the information that you want. So again, passive DNS it's a historical record. So you have entries in your database that have the first seen time for a given domain. Um, sometimes you have IP address mappings with that domain as well. So you know like how the IP address changed over time relative to that domain. So first seen, last seen, so you know how recent it is and the, the count. So you can just gauge general like prevalence on your network. And the one that we like to use because it integrates super well with Zclogs is Justin Azov's uh, Bro PDNS. So it's a um, it's a Go program and you just point it at Zeke logs, Zeke DNS logs, and it just ingests it. Like if you don't do any other configuration, just throws it into a SQLite database for you. You can put it in a, a better database if you want or a, a, a remote database. But. So let's see what an example of this looks like. So this is um, this is the Bro PDNS command line interface. So we're looking if we look for an individual domain called example.com, this is what we get back. We get the domain that we're looking for. We get what type of query if it was a question or answer, which for a domain it's I think it's always going to show up as a question or a query, I guess is probably what the Q stands for. And then we get the count, and then again, we get the first and last scene times. So this first scene is what we're going to key off of to know, is this newly available, or is this newly seen in our network? And here's another example where you get the IP address mappings as well. So there was one, one record here with example, but when we also map it to the IP addresses, we can see we've seen example.com multiple times and it just so happens like sometimes over IPv6, sometimes over IPv4, different IP addresses over time and you can just look at the how, how they've changed over over the course. So again, we're, we're going to key off that first. Okay, before I get into this, I see CJ. CJ, what's up? That's your cue. Way to be you attentive. Got a question. Yeah. Yeah, someone said, what is a better way of viewing Windows events? Sysmon question mark? Yeah, um, so let's hold that to the end. Aha, uh -huh. very so, good. Because we have 17 slides and 20 minutes, so. Yeah, you know what, we'll I hold mean, all yeah. the questions to the end. Yeah, well that's, yeah, but let's hold that to the end. Press on. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, so again, we can we can look for an individual domain and see when is the first time it's been seen, but we still don't know like is that a good indicator? So this these are possible anomalies that we came up with. So let's answer the question: How many how many new CloudFront domains do we see each day? And this is the command that we happen to use to do it. But we're we're pulling out that first um, first column, if you will, from the from the passive DNS database, and it, all all subdomains of cloudfront.net and we can see here there's hundreds tens to hundreds every day um the, this is i'm pretty sure is a weekend so usually you see ebbs and flows weekends go down but on an, any given day we've got 100 new uh, like roughly 100 new ones so that is that is not feasible to go through like that's not something that we could key off of and say like oh let's let's go investigate these hundred domains. <laughs> so, but but we might be able to come back to that. So this is what it kind of looks like graphed. So this um, this is only a few results, but if we graph that, we, we again, we can see the ebbs and flows for weekends, um, but just in general, it, there's hundreds of new ones. So let's move on to our next one, so abnormal traffic volume. So here we're pulling out of the SSL logs. And again, we're looking at cloudfront.net and the server name indicator field that we were talking about earlier. And so this is pulling out the most frequent occurrence, the, the five most frequent occurrences. What do you think about this, Derek? I'm thinking, man, what are these commands actually, uh, uh, what are they? Hang on, we're gonna tell you about that in a second, right? Like it's yeah. part of THT, right? 
Um, so what do I think about that? Without knowing anything about uh, those domains at all, um, there are two that stick out statistically speaking, right? There's standard deviations, one well above everything else, right? And then a second one that's, you know, significantly above, but not the orders of magnitude of the first one, right? And then what I would consider to be probably more normal than the first two. So, I, I mean, I wouldn't know why at this point, why those were there, but that would be interesting, right? Yeah. And we're only showing the most frequent five. So right. it, it goes down from here. If we looked at you know, how many results, that might be a good thing to know too, but we can't fit that on a slide. <laughs> well, right, one thing so, I do want to know is, did you make this graph on the command line? Uh, this one, no. Oh, I okay. could now, but <laughs> no, it, it, this one is in Excel. Uh, so so here's, here's a graph, like there's no, I'm committing a sin here by not labeling this access, but it doesn't really matter. It's, it's a uh, individual, dom it's the individual domains um, from, just think this, but in graph format. There's a difference between creating a visualization for your personal investigation versus putting it out for other people to consume. Right? Yeah, so that's fair. This is an investigation graph. So these are the first two entries, and these are the rest. One thing I want to point out here, this is a logarithmic scale. If if So when I graph this not logarithmic, you couldn't see all these other ones. <laughs> all you saw was this first spike and like a little tiny dot for the second one. So we're gonna call that one interesting. Or, yeah, or that's anomalous. anomaly. That's an anomalous. An anomalous. Well, yeah, interesting. It's it's something we can key off of. Like that's, we've got one data point that we can start investigating, possibly two. So let's, let's do that. Uh, let's figure out when this started. So again, same kind of commands we've seen earlier, which are probably new to most people, unless you've used THT, but <laughs> um, we're pulling out of the SSL logs, all CloudFront traffic. We're looking at the timestamps, and with this, it converts it to a date, and then we're going to graph it. So this actually was generated on the command line <laughs> with this command. I'll set you up better so, next time. Normally, Normally you'd want to graph longer time frames than this. It just so happens the data set we were looking at only had this amount of traffic or uh, days in it. But you can definitely see a spike on this. Um, it's probably a Tuesday or something. <laughs> Wednesday maybe on this 25th. So that is that is interesting because we know like this traffic doesn't go back months and months. Like this traffic pattern of tons and tons of requests to CloudFront, like it just started. So that's that's interesting. So now let's go back to our for newly seen domains. Like when's the first time we saw this domain? So so here's where if you slice and dice like these anomalies different ways and approach them like from a different lens, they can be useful. So we we couldn't start with a newly observed domain, but now that we have one to key off of, it's definitely useful information that we can pull off pull out of. So this is our this is our top domain that we were looking at before. And we can see the first first time it was seen was uh, this date doesn't mean anything right now, but like it it was new at the time. So that was another interesting point for it. Like, hey, this is this is new, and this traffic just started happening, and it's like well above our baseline. So now we want to know what machines were talking to that domain, right? Like, which of our machines internally? which ones uh, they, uh, wh which systems internally are talking to them, right? So we can pull on that string a little bit more. And so again, filtering this out, uh, SSL uh, and some other commands that go off the top of the screen. Long story short, from what we can tell, there are only four IPs in a network of hundreds of computers that are talking to this CloudFront domain. Again, we're not saying it's malicious, it's just that that's, that's interesting. That's a lot of yeah. traffic for a couple of machines. And it's it's always a good sign when we can run something like this and get a handful of results, something that we could investigate manually. If we start getting, I would say more than 20 results, maybe even more than 10, I, I'm gonna probably readjust our question to, yeah. to get something a little more interesting. That's actually a good overall point to make, right? When you're working with large amounts of data, uh, you have to filter it down to a digestible amount for whatever tool that you're you're using. And if the tool is your personal brain, 
you're not anything more than 10 or 20 data points, I think you need to filter a little bit more if you have to manually go off and investigate that stuff. So. Yeah. All right, so we've kind of alluded to all these commands that we've been running. And I'm not going to go through them all here on the webcast, but when the slides are available later, so this is a good segue, people are asking, the slides are not available currently, but we'll put, post them in the the channel for the webcast slides afterwards. Um, but, you, but you can go back and reference this. Um, THD, if you go to the, the website, there's also documentation there that you can peruse, but here's a, a nice cheat sheet. But all right, so the third anomaly that we had talked about at the beginning was JAW3 hash. So what can we do with that? Let's let's talk about what is the JAW3 hash first. So it, you can kind of think of it, so it's it's the analogy of um, what user agent is to HTTP traffic, JAW3 is to SSL traffic or TLS traffic. And the same, a lot of the same limitations and caveats like go along with it. So user agent, completely defined by the client. So if it's an attacker, it the attacker can change it to whatever they want. It's arbitrary. And it's it's a little more difficult to do that with JAW3, but you could definitely do it. Like you can program to get a specific JAW3 or a JAW3 that matches some other common JAW3, like some other software that uses the same JAW3. But that doesn't mean we can't try to use it. Like it's this is out there as a thing. Like people have it installed by default in Zeek for a reason. Um, there, there's also uh, with JAW three hashes. There's a client and a server value too, right? Like there's there are two yes. in, in the in the Z clocks. There's yeah from the client handshake and and then the server side handshake, right? Right. So yeah, I mentioned JAW three is the equivalent to like the user agent, and I, I don't know what uh, like I suppose the JAW three S would be equivalent to what like a web server server uh, headers like that it returns, like if it if it has a version or something. Um, someone in chat mentioned JARM, which is a, I, can't, I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's along the same lines. It's put out by the same Salesforce, Salesforce folks. Um, the difference is JAW3 is completely passive. If Like if you have a passive monitoring, network monitoring, you can calculate the JAW3. Uh, JARM requires interaction with the, the target server. Like you have to actively basically basically scan the target server. So JARM is definitely interesting, but it's not something that we can implement at scale. And it's, it's, someone will prove me wrong, but <laughs> I would be hesitant to to do that um, just across like all, all web servers that we see. Like, all right, so again, we're keying off the domain that we've already identified. And we're looking at the SSL logs, which we know the Zeek SSL logs is where the JAW3 is. And we're pulling out the same uh, the, the same force hosts that we've already seen, but this time we're pulling extra an extra piece of information. That's the, the JAW3 hash. And we can know it like they all use the same JAW3 hash. So th to me, this tells me, all right, all four of these systems are using the same software, most likely, to communicate to this interesting domain that we've pulled out so Derek your audio is not coming through sorry my wife started to vacuum um <laughs> it, now it's getting super interesting that four hosts are talking with the same software that's super interesting yes my interest level is getting higher and higher right okay so again we can we can pivot this we can look at things in a slightly different lens so we're no longer looking for the CloudFront domain. We're just we're pulling out that JAW3 hash. Like, okay, how how frequent is that used? Like, could, are we getting collisions, or maybe it's like some software that's installed on other systems that we could, you know, track down and attribute this as benign. You know, there's there's all sorts of things. But just looking at how the, so this is across the entire network to any any destination. We're no longer looking at CloudFront. So how how many times is this used? And we can see that there's 84 different um, 84 different sources. So that's that's less interesting. I mean, it's it's not something I'm going to go investigate each one of those 84 sources, but it's good to know, like, all right, so this this JAW three is interesting because we found it in the course of our investigation, but it could also be used elsewhere. But I'm going to back up a couple slides because I just want to reiterate this point: JAW three hash. Uh, there can be different clients with the same JAW three hash. Same thing with user agent. Like you can 
set a user agent that's the same, or especially with JAW3, collisions just happen naturally because it has to do with how the SSL uh, handshake happens. Yeah, how the cypher and, suite, the order of yeah. them. Yeah, and so, so if you, you've got software that's using the same underlying SSL library, it's quite likely that they'll have the same hashes. So let's let's go this, let's pivot a little more. So again, across the whole network, we're looking at every one that's using that hash. Let's look at the server name. Let's pull out the, ser the server name indicator field to see where are they going. Like, so we know everyone, everyone, these results is using this client. Where are they going as a destination? And so this is what I think is interesting. Derek, I'm going to call on you again. What What do you think is interesting about this? I think it's super interesting that they're all, except for one, um, apparently related to Microsoft, but yet the traffic that we were originally investigating is going to an Amazon CDN. I mean, that's not what I would expect. I, if it was Azure, uh, you know, Azure CDN, maybe that would kind of align a little better. I mean, again, not saying it's malicious it's just certainly yeah. interesting so, and i guess that what that tells me is whatever we're investigating um is likely using some kind of windows api to encrypt the traffic or some windows service yeah yeah that's a possible explanation that's what i was just going to say too oh okay <laughs> yeah <I'm> sorry <laughs> no, no 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 i'm glad you did all right so it's this is a client that's been used to communicate with CloudFront, and it's uh, if we look at the the relative number of connections, it's way, well and above what's the baseline for Microsoft. Oh, so been... I would still say it's it's likely interesting. And now we're pivoting yet again. So this this is almost like going into incident response mode except i don't know we, we haven't like technically declared an incident or anything but say we're worried about like what maybe maybe an attacker has used this to start up other um maybe that more than one c2 server i guess that that would be the kind of thing we're looking here or we on the flip side if we came back with like a ton of results for different cloudfront destinations maybe we think okay whatever client is using this just talks to a bunch of CloudFront. Like it, it's common for this client to talk to CloudFront. Like we could we could have discovered that here too if we had come back with a lot of results, a lot of different destinations. But yeah. in this case, there's three CloudFront destinations. And if we remember back to the newly newly seen CloudFront domains, we're seeing hundreds per day. So the facts we we know we know there's a lot of CloudFront destinations, but we've got it down to three here, and the top one, of course, is the one that we've seen before. But then we've got two two new ones. I should have just made these like funny names because they could be random, and it would be easier for people to remember. But <laughs> but this is the kind of thing that you're looking at. It makes your eyes bleed when you're in the midst of it. All right, so. So I feel like I'd like to make the point real quick that like the if this were like if it were my network and I got to this point in the investigation, like I would be pivoting into host space logs to figure yeah, out what in the world is making that connection, right? Like that's the point of the investigation, right? So yeah. So uh, the next slide was the right. conclusion slide for like this example. And yeah, De Derek made a good segue. Like at this point, we've got we've got a small list like we've we've gone through our funnel we've we've gotten a tiny list of interesting potentially bad that we don't actually know enough about yet because we're just looking at network data and that's kind of the point we were making earlier too is like we've got different sources that show you different things we've kind of reached the limits of what network data could show us so as Derek mentioned like if we had host data available we'd probably pivot to some of these hosts start looking at like all right Hopefully our EDR will tell us what JAW3 is is being used because a lot of them will do do that. So we can pivot into EDR data or host-based data with the JAW3 um, SSL connections, or we could look at destinations too. Yeah. And we could go start looking at, okay, what process is doing that? And yeah, it, then, it, then it's a different lens on threat hunting. Uh, you get into host-based analysis, but. Yeah, coming soon, so, man. So, 
So, yeah, so the, the 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 conclusion here was, well, I mean, this wasn't really a contrived example. Like we were actually being attackers in the network, and this was actual command and control. This was customized shell code that you know ran Cobalt Strike, right? So Joff and I were on a red team engagement, and we were acting in the network, and we were trying to get found by our own service, which was a really fun engagement, and it it worked. And so we were we were actually uncovered. Um, maybe I don't know, a less than a day after the, the thing started. So um, yeah, good job, so, team. I'm gonna actually run through those again quick because I think it's important. So the first thing we ended up pulling out was the 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 main C2 server that they used, and then when we pivoted, we found four hosts that were compromised. There was there was like maybe one main one or two main hosts, but then we noticed something in common with these other ones. And then we pivoted again and noticed that there's other uh, those, cloud front. Those were our testing. So, hands. <laughs> yeah, so, so we found the main C2, but by pivoting slightly at each of, the, at each of these steps, we kind of like widened our net slightly right. and we ended up finding actually, more, more of the now, I think One was testing and one was long haul, now that I think about it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it was back in June. Go ahead. Lots <laughs> happened since. Then. All right, so this isn't perfect, and we realize that this may not work on an, every network. Um, this network, I would say, actually had a light CloudFront usage. Like they weren't, mm -hmm. they didn't have business processes that were hosted in AWS using CloudFront, or had a customer that was using CloudFront. Like. We were we were almost lucky to see that there was that anomalous spike to CloudFront. So your mileage may vary. It, you're, maybe you will have a spike. Maybe it's not quite as exaggerated as what we had in, in this network. But like, yeah, I mean, the, that's the thing is these are always special snowflakes, right? And it's really the the tools and the techniques and the analysts that make the difference, not the exact procedure of what 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 we uh, accomplish, right? That's why we start out with a hypothesis and then we have a loose framework of filtering data and getting to the point of the question that we want to answer. Yeah. So we, some of the problems that would in, we'd run into in this particular example, we've already covered in general, but encryption. So we, we relied on the SNI field. And if that's encrypted, we don't have visibility in that. So we can't, we can't use that anymore. We still have the JAW3 hash, but as we saw, like that's that collides with other places. So if we didn't have the ability to differentiate uh, that JAW3 going to CloudFront versus going to Microsoft, maybe we have to get more creative and pull in different log sources. Like, oh, this destination IP, the who is information says it belongs to CloudFront, and these all say they belong to Microsoft. Like, there's other ways to look at this data. So it's it's all about thinking about what's yeah, your your hypothesis. Where do, where do you want to end up, and how can you get there with the data that you have? And we're not going to talk about DNS over HTTP as the the evil that that is. So no. Yeah. All right. Should we answer some questions, or should we do our about us? Let's just do the about us real quick because I think it's right. we got two minutes and um yeah. some references. Um, if you liked what you saw, um. We are in the middle of writing a course on this kind of topic, and hopefully it will be ready uh, sometime in early to mid-ish 2022. Yeah, I would say we're we're focusing on, like, we're, we're taking a data analysis, data science approach to threat hunting to try to work in networks where maybe our traditional methods don't work just because there's too much data, and, like, how do we pull out stuff from the noise? And so, yeah, it, I guess I'll just put it out there. If anyone has things that they'd like to see along these lines in Discord, ideas of stuff, feel free. I mean, or questions or whatever. We'll, we'll try to hang out in the threat hunting well, channel afterwards. Uh, too, CJ, the, for the question that he had, uh, what was a better way of viewing Windows event logs? I think the, uh, the built-in Windows event viewer is probably the most terrible interface ever made <laughs> to look at a Windows log file, because you look at one at a time, and you're not going to look at 38,000 log entries one at a time. So the better way to view it, in my opinion, would be to put an agent on the machine 
or use Windows Event Collector to get all the event logs into a central repository that you can then do this kind of thing on, where you would do have the ability to, to stack data and look at different things, look for anomalous command line uh, entries, that kind of stuff, right? And uh, I hope, I, I, the plan is, is that we're gonna have that, those kinds of techniques in our upcoming class as well. So, so Derek's answer is probably the right answer, like putting it in a SIM or something that can centralize can all your logs. I found a link my, with eight tools to do that. My so. my answer is going to be, let's move it back to the command line. <laughs> so I, I, I would have got you there, just eventually. Yeah, I would. Um, there, there are some tools I've seen out there. I haven't used them yet, but I, they're on my radar to like play with. But and, and like so, a, the EVTX format, the XML format, can either parsing that directly or converting it to something that's a little more usable, like JSON. Um, those are possibilities. There were a so number I'm, of tools that had nice panels with the rows, like you said, in fields, and you could jump them around. Solar Winds had one. There were a bunch of people out there doing. Yeah. So we're going to do a real quick, thank you so much for joining us today. That's the one hour webcast. We're going to stick around for some extra content, extra time. We'll answer your questions. And so CJ will be looking for them. I'll be looking for them. We'll trade back and forth. CJ finds one, I find one. We ask you, then we ask Derek. Uh, but if you need to head out, we totally understand it. If you ever need a threat hunt, red team, pen test, active sock, you know where to find us. Uh, and with that, <laughs> webcast is over. Good job, Ethan. Good job. Sure. Well one one question I saw earlier that I think would be interesting. It's more of a discussion topic, but they asked, uh, "What's the, what what would we say the difference is between detection engineering and threat hunting?" Engineering and building. Yeah. Um, that is a fantastic question. Actually, I think so too. Yeah. Um, I would say, I'd say there's a lot of nuance and overlap between the two, right? I would say that detection engineering can tend to be specific to the the tool set and the framework that you're working with. Um, but there are ways, of course, to, to make those detections go across platforms. Um, whereas threat hunting, you might take the same kind of detections um, and, and go off looking for things that might ne not necessarily be an alert. Maybe this is a, a good way to look at it. I look at like detection engineering is writing a detection that is super specific to catch as close to the, the condition that you want to catch. That's relatively high fidelity, right? Like an alerting type scenario, in my opinion, you really only want to get an alert when you know it's actionable, right? And so you have this narrow detection that you're looking at that we're going to, we know it's bad, like say a no, a known bad file hash, for example, right? We know that's bad, right? Whereas uh, you, you, if you're going to go threat hunting, you might have a looser net of that detection to go off and find more conditions that you can yeah. then do what we were just describing to filter down. Uh, that'd be my opinion. Uh, yeah, I think you're right on the, but the engineering is always building something. Hunting is doing the detective work. Yeah, I would engineering say engineering is ahead detection. of the game trying to build it, right? That's an Well, I would say detection engineering a lot of time would fall out of the hunting process. So you're you're hunting for the unknown. Once you have something that yielded results, then that could be moved into detection engineering where you decide like, okay, what's the best way we can find and alert on this in an automated fashion? Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Offense right. informs defense. <laughs> yeah, I got a question. It says all these analysis can be done in, in sim. We have log, all logs ingested. Why should I use external tool like Red Hunt tool? You should not have to. Yeah, use use what you have. Um, mm -hmm. The the reasoning behind THD is we were coming to an environments without that. We we didn't have a sim, so it was either spend the time and research to like get a sim set up and ingested and heavier hardware requirements and every one to two week engagement or develop like streamline the process that we are already using and make it a little more efficient so these same types of things like well i'm planning to cover this in our course too like there's you can search you can filter you can do aggregations like combine things together you can do calculations, so like maybe you add um, bytes sent, bytes received, and get total bytes. Like it, there's all these basic building blocks 
and what tool you use to actually do that. Just just use what you're familiar with, what you have available. Yeah, usually what I tell our clients, um, you know, as a general uh, like rule of thumb is don't always look for a new tool. Use what you have and then go get a new tool when that thing that you have isn't fulfilling some kind of need, right? And then, you know, the point is is actually spot on. Like if I have a SIM, let's say I had everything going into an Elastic stack. Well, Elastic gives me a lot of capabilities that I might not necessarily have on the command line, like machine learning, right? I mean, you know, I mean, I know machine learning is one of those buzzwords, but there are applications and in information security that it is useful. I don't think it's a silver bullet that fixes everything, but there are things that you can do to find anomalies with machine learning that are definitely valid. Um, so I, I think that they're, it's really picking the right tool. And, and, and as Ethan was saying, we have clients that would stand up Security Onion. And one of the reasons that it's Docker is because, well, that's already on Security Onion, right? It's just easy and you can just deploy it and start using it. Nice. This is an early way back question. Did they catch it correctly that to get logs in Azure AD, it can cause extra costs? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say that I'm an expert on Microsoft licensing and maybe someone else at BHIS who's around who's a, who can come on and talk about it, but it's my understanding to log appropriately, uh, you need an E5 license. So someone actually about. responded to that comment earlier. Um, they said they have an E3 license and then they said, mentioned something about P2, which I don't know what that is, but they said the P2 was the critical part and they've got logs going into okay. Azure. You may have already paid that. Uh, I've said people have probably heard me say this before, but I, I am convinced and I have been for over a decade that every year uh, the, the sales engineers at Microsoft have throw a raging kegger up in Redmond and <laughs> and and as a Christmas party. And they all sit around and think about how they can make licensing more complicated. I mean, I, I'm sure that's what happens. It's a good it's a worthy, worthy subject and, and drinking helps. So. Is there an open source IR tool with similar similar capability to Tanium? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, Tanium is kind of a unique animal where it doesn't have a central repository of data and it uses some peer-to-peer -peer thing, right? Like, or am I thinking of a different one? I think that's the right one. I think it's kind of fairly unique in that regard, but I think, uh, I don't know of an open source EDR that's popular. I mean, there's bound to be one out there. I think Elastic might come close. I think you can use Elastic for free, the Elastic Endpoint Agent, which is based on in-game, right? Can you use it commercially? I, I don't know that you can use it commercially, but I don't know that it's real expensive either either, either in a commercial setting. Like, I, I mean, I get, Right, but you can use it at home for free, but if you're gonna- Right, I, th I think that's true, so. Yes, you can use Elastic EDR. Um, oh, go Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. I've said it before. It's probably one of the best EDR solutions that you can get for like free, right? Without like you know a 30 day. Yeah. Free as in beer. And the game solution is also a, a decent EDR solution as well. It like will the only cost you part of your life. Well, yeah. Well, I mean that's all open it. source isn't really free right because the time and effort to deploy it is worth something right there's a trade-off there between buying a product and spending your own time and effort to stand up a product right so yeah what's your time worth speaking of which um one of the reasons why we do these webcasts is because one you could hire us to do it but we'd rather you learn how to do it and figure out how to do it and take care of it yourself and not really need us uh, so <laughs> along those lines if you look in the go to webinar uh, you'll see there's a Active Countermeasures did a six hour threat hunting training course um, by Chris Breton. And so if you're new to threat hunting, if this is, you looked at this today and you're like, I'm interested, I wanna know more about this, is a free class. Like you just go, you watch it, it's on YouTube. It's got a downloadable VM. You don't have to pay anything for it. It's not behind a paywall. Like just go get the information, learn it yourself, do these things yourself. And at some point come back if you ever need us for anything. But for the most part, we wanna teach you to fish so you don't have to come to us to get fish. I see people mentioning Velociraptor and Gur. Those aren't really EDRs, though, right? I thought Velociraptor was like an evidence collection framework. Maybe I'm wrong. And Gur was like, is Gur maintained still? I don't know that it is. I haven't heard of that one. I've heard Velociraptor has been called a called an EDR too, though. I think John, when he did his open source like 
web uh, yeah webcast of open source EDRs. I think you mentioned Velociraptor there too. But yeah, I, I thought I, I, I've seen it more was maintained anymore, but I don't know if that's true. No, oh. I mean that's sort of like the point, right? Is like there's so many tools. I ran into an EDR the other day. I never, I'd never even heard of them before. I I don't even know what it was. So so many tools, so little time. Yeah, it was uh, I yeah. Well, so I think there was another question that I saw up here. And what about what is encrypted SNI? Config or no to look people. So that's a fantastic question, extreme paperclip. Um, uh, so THT doesn't require any configuration, assuming that you're like you have Docker running and you get the container, you can run THT. You shouldn't need any extra config on top of that. Caveat that that's on a Linux system. If you want to get it running on Windows, um, I, I did it. Ethan did it. it. I, I failed, but you know it wasn't. Got, it wasn't. If you have W WS uh, WSL two with Docker, yeah, uh, I just copied and pasted the command from the README and it worked. So. And then uh, the the second part of that question: Does it know to look for typical paths for Z clogs? So the way it's going to work is it's going to map to uh, a folder on your in your in the root home directory, and you can go or the root drive rather. And you can go front slash host, and then you'll see the all like the host file structure, and you can go to your logs from there, depending on wherever they're stored. Yeah, the the I don't, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, but the the main command that you use first is called filter, and it's really if you think about it like find plus grep. So it it will recursively look in your current directory wherever you are. So go to the root of where all your logs are. And then you can give it command line arguments like beyond that if I had to, a to narrow it down. A pipe find a grep. Yeah, well, with filter, you don't have to, although I've been, it works for like common cases. Like I want all logs below the directory, like in the directory and below where I'm mm -hmm. at. But if mm -hmm. you want, if you want to slice and dice beyond that, it's really best to use, like I, I use FD find mm -hmm. because it's less boilerplate. <laughs> Okay. So, I mean, I, I guess, you know, hit us up on Discord um, if you have any additional questions. I think you know where to find this. I'll, I'll make sure that I at least have Discord open and on the threat hunting channel for the rest of the day, but you could always IM me if you want. <laughs> uh, and Keith just dropped um, a link to subscribe to Active Countermeasures if you want to catch the next live course that they're doing over uh, there. And then that's the free course and then Derek and Ethan you'll probably do something next year that'll be with that anti-siphon and if you're like what are all these names anti-siphon active countermeasures lawless hack the best black hills information security uh John Strand is busy he's a busy man he likes to do a lot of things and so I usually can it to uh garbage pail kids that we used to collect when we were a kid he's like collecting businesses like garbage pail kids <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, if you have no more questions, well, we actually don't have any time to answer any more questions. I'm sure you have questions. Just go ahead and ask them in Discord. Uh, thank you so much, Ethan. I'm going to give you last words, and then I'll give Derek last words. So, Ethan, any last words? Um, I'm going to reboot into Linux so that I can generate the slides for everyone. <laughs> Where are those going to be, Ethan? That had multiple. They're on Discord, right? We'll put yeah, them on Discord, and we'll also put them on the website. Do you ever do you ever put them in the YouTube description? Because when I watch webcasts on YouTube, that's where I always look for them. That is a good place for them. So uh, my you? last words are: Thanks, Deb. I appreciate the garbage pail kids pick. <laughs> Not even. Looking All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Hey, Derek didn't get his last yet. words. I won't. Hey, he was done. He was done. You're my last. Oh, word. that's it. Okay. All right, bye, everybody. Go. Bye. Go bye. Work. All right, I'm going to end the webinar. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.